But the Vestach and America nice Lubav. He'd been here for all these years. And his father had just come from Russia. He didn't know the rules of 770. You know the halachas of 770. So when it comes 10 o'clock, everybody knows you got to go away from that front walkway because the Rebbe's going to walk up the steps. So he's talking to this Russian friend of his. And at the last second, the American guy does a, a, a disappearing act. And this poor Russian ends up standing right in the Rebbe's path. The car drives up. He has no idea whose car it is. The car opens and out pops the Rebbe. And he's standing right there. So he, obviously he felt very self-conscious. You know, he came from Russia two days ago, and now he's blocking the Rebbe's way. The Rebbe turns to his friend who would just run off to hide and says to him, like, so he makes sure he doesn't get away, and says, Wie gefällt dir, wie sie seine Neues gewachsen? Wie gefällt dir, wie sie seine Neues gewachsen? Which means, how, do you, how, how impressed are you with how they grew up? You know, you left Russia all those years ago. They've been in Russia till today. No? Are they okay? Are they besay the vigya felt of his I don't know his So the story was that the Rebbe asked a few of those chavret or Jewish Russian chassidim who came in the 1970s to go and visit Rebbe Moshe Feinstein. Rebbe Moshe, as he was called, Rebbe Moshe Stam. You, I'm sure you've heard the name Rebbe Moshe. Rebbe Moshe was a litve sherid. He was a misnagid. He came from chassidim. He even had a shachas to chabad, but he was a, a litve sherid. No question about it, he was a misnagid sherid. But he was a Russian Jew, number one, who had lived through Stalin himself. And he was a big honor. He was a very, very humble man. And he was a person of MS, no doubt about it. The Rebbe had a very, the Rebbe liked him. The Rebbe, the Rebbe liked him. And the Rebbe asked four or five of these Rosh Hashanah to go to Rebbe Moshe. And he sent along Rabbi Chadikov. Rabbi Chadikov's job was to introduce each one of them. And the Rebbe asked that they shouldn't prava nivis. They should, they should not hide. The Moshe should see who they are. So they came to the Mesha and they had a whole conversation. The Mesha was so excited. Rusha Sayyidin. He was a Rusha Sayyid. He came from Russia in the 1930s. He knew what meant Yiddishkeit in Rusland. And this is the 1970s, 45 years after he left Russia. And you're seeing Elokh from a Yidin coming from Russia. And the pillow was that from children, from children raised in the Soviet Union, three generations down. So they had a wonderful fab fabrengen with the Mesha Feinstein. At the end of the Fabreng, and Amisha says, I have one more question. How did you manage? How do you manage when your life, every day you're afraid for your life, literally, every day, and you get married, and you have children, and you raise your children, and your children grow up, and your children get married. How do you manage to, to keep your head, to keep Yiddish guy, and so on and so forth? So each one gave a different answer. One said, we manage because we always hope that one day we'll have this chus, that we'll actually see the Rebbe. Another one said, the Fabrengens. We managed because we got together, made Fabrengens. Another one said, we had a lot of Avos Yisrael amongst ourselves. This is what held us. And one of them said, in Yiddish, Abredet Megahat. We had a choice. <laughs> you live in Russia, it's hard, but you got to be a Jew. And Abredet Megahat. And Moshe Feinstein was always came from this. So one person's explanation was Rebbe. Second person's explanation was Avos Yisrael. Third person, Fabrengens. But the other, what was the explanation? I don't understand. What kind of question is that? What kind of question is that? We lived in Russia. It was hard. You got to be a Jew, right? If it's in America, it's easier to be a Jew. In Russia, it's harder to be a Jew. But you got to be a Jew. That's it. So however the Fabrengen of Chavzai and Odarishin goes, and it was exactly the same. It was a Monday night. It was 30 years ago tonight. I will never forget it as long as I live. Obviously, any person who remembers it. I was already married. I had a little girl. And I was teaching in yeshiva. And that month of Oder, Tafshin Nun Beis, was a very... Bechlal, Oder, Nun Beis was a very happy year. There was a very, very good moment of Matzev. Until Oder started. And as soon as Oder started, as soon as Oder started, the, the mood by the Rebbe shifted. It seemed that way, at least. The Rebbe spoke almost every night. You know, the last few weeks for the stroke, the Rebbe spoke almost every night. When you look at it in hindsight, you see clearly the Rebbe Pashat was chapping a rain. He spoke almost every night, and, and there were nights when he didn't speak, where he just came out and handed out dollars. All the reason that is, on a shigaret, the Rebbe went to the oil Monday. He was leaving the oil, and he fell down. We were in yeshiva. So a boy, I was in 10th grade, I was teaching kids. A boy, a bacher ran in, it was my second year on the job, and he ran in and he said, the Rebbe fell by the oil, run downstairs and say till. So we ran downstairs and said till. 
7 o'clock, we got on the bus. We came back to Crown Heights. Nobody went home. We went to 770. When we got to 770, the Rebbe was still not back from the oil. It took a very long time for the Rebbe to come back from the oil. We hung around all night. In one corner, people are saying, Tillman crying. In another corner, people are dancing. Now, why would you dance? The Rebbe fell by the oil. First of all, we didn't know until the next morning that the Rebbe had a stroke. I, I mean, a lot of people fall, you know. We, we didn't know with a stroke. It we, we, we didn't cross our mind. The Rebbe fell. But the Rebbe spoke so much about Simcha. The Rebbe spoke about so much about Simcha, that other. And then you have 60 days, you have two others, exactly the same as this year. Exactly, everything was the same. For Yaakov and Kudi was separate, Chavzai and other was on Monday, and there were two others. And um, the Rebbe said 60 days, two others in 60 days. The idea of 60 is Batl B'Shishim, that if anything is supposed to happen, not good, it's Batl B'Shishim. That's how the Rebbe spoke 60 years ago, Batl B'Shishim. So Chavah were dancing. The people came in from the mansion, came in to see what's going on, and they saw a three-ring circus. I mean, uh, <laughs> there's nothing unusual about 770 being a three-ring <laughs> circus. But one guy says to the other, Mishaguim, crazy people. So the second guy says to the first guy, Nine, see them. The Rebbe said, Dance, we danced. That night, and again, I, I don't know if this is true, but this is what we, we heard. I was in 770 till late. The, the first report that we had was that the Rebbe said, Sevezayin Arafu Shleimo Kreva. But if Shira Vizimra, that was the lush. Will be on Fuwa Shlaimo Kreva, but Roiv Shira Vizimra. I heard many years later from Dr. Rosen that he said that the Rebbe had a difficulty with speaking, Kayachal. But two words that came out clear was Shira Vizimra. Shira Vizimra. So this is what happened 30 years ago. So now, we're sitting here and having a Fabrengen, which is a miracle in itself. Right? So you can ask any question, the answer is always going to be the same. The answer is going to be a bereda hotman. What are you supposed to do? You don't know what you're supposed to do. I'll tell you what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to be besimcha. You're supposed to have betachem, and you're supposed to work very hard on doing the right thing. And connect connected to the rebbe. Right? I have a list. I wrote down three things. I have lists of papers. I have, I can talk. I got notes. You have no idea how many notes I have. Don't worry. I'm not going to read them all. One of my notes says simcha. Tahara Oir. This is from an old speech, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're about to chasid him, right? What's a trade of a lavav chasid? We're afraid of chayid. That's it. Everybody knows it. Everybody knows it. What's a lavav chasid? Afraid of chayid. A happy Jew is a lavav chasid. I'll tell you a story. I was a kid. I was. I mean, I don't know how old you are. Some some of you may be old ladies, but some of you are still young. Yeah? <laughs> Over twenty, under twenty. <laughs> Oh, maybe 21, yeah. Um, I was your age, and I went to speak in a shul. I'm making a speech in a shul. But I was very, very nervous, so I take a long moral support. Who was my moral support? My father. My father was going to sit in the audience, and he was going to nod. <laughs> I was going to get through my speech. I walk into the shul, the shtibel, on one of the little streets on, on the way to Oster, of, of Flappish. It was in a private house, the, the second floor of the Rav lived. The first house, the first floor was the shul. I took a look at the Rav. The Rav is a chassid shayid, with the buah, the rishabod. His payas were hidden, and he didn't have a shtraimo. It was very unusual to a chassid shayid that a big beard, no shtraimo. And I understood later, this was a Holocaust survivor. And since the Holocaust, he wasn't wearing a shtraimo. You took one look at him, and you saw he was a holy man. I, I had two times experiences. I went to speak in the shul. And I met Jews that, uh, in, in the outside Labavish, I'll call them Sadiqim. Uh, Mamish, beautiful, beautiful Jews. The man was in his 70s. I heard the lady was a very, very big lamb. There was a gone, a big Talmud Chacham, a Chassidish with an enormous amount of bittle. When I got to make my speech, I realized I didn't even have to bring my father. Why? Because this old Rav went from his seat in the front and sat down right next to my father, and he was my audience. I spoke to him. He needed to hear my drasha, you understand. When the Lubavitcher gets up to speak, half the show walks out, half the show stands by the door to the side if they want to listen. And if you guys stay and listen, the Rav Tzachavegish felt he moved away from his place. <coughs> anyway, I got through my speech, okay? People wanted to know how come the old one didn't speak and the young one spoke. Go explain to them, Lubavitch. <laughs> um, but after Maida, we danced. We started dancing, so of course the whole show runs away from the Meshuggah, the diseased <laughs> Lubavitcher. You'll be around them, you'll get sick by association. I placed a couple of guys from the shul stayed. We danced. As soon as we started dancing, this Rav joins us. A tanz mitun And two bachrim, 
younger Bachrim were standing at a distance and they were uncomfortable. I understand that. It's self-conscious. You know, being a Lubavitcher is wonderful and fun and crazy, but it's not so easy. And they were embarrassed. And this Rav sees two Lubavitcher Bachrim standing and not joining in the dancing. So he motions to them that they should join the dancing. And they, you know how they, you know, when you don't want to do something, you know, you respond by not responding. They, they let them know that they're not joining the dance. And he's beckoning them fiercely. Come, tell us. And they're hesitating. And he stops. I'll never forget it as long as I live. And with so much emotion, he didn't scream, but I see that it hurt him. Isn't Dach Lubavitch? You're Lubavitch. Isn't you Lubavitch? You don't want to dance. Isn't Dach Lubavitch? Now I've I've had thirty five years. This probably happened when I came back for Shlichus. Thirty four, thirty five. That's a long time ago, and I played this movie a thousand times in my head. This is one of the stories that I live over and over again. This Jew saw Hasidus before the Holocaust. You know how it's supposed to look. And you know how Hasidus looked after the Holocaust with all the beautiful Streimlach and the Heimish and the Heimish, Heimish, Heimish. He knew what's real. And Lubavitch, he, he, Lubavitch is real. And when the Lubavitcher doesn't want to dance, it bothered him. It pushed it. The guy was probably close to 80. He was so upset. Isn't a Lubavitcher? So the question is whatever the question is, but that's the answer. Chov zay nodir. I don't know which date is more earth-shattering. I mean, Gimel Thomas is Gimel Thomas, but Chov zay nodir or Chov Ches Nissen. You know, they, you know, as, to quote our president, the dates that live in infamy, you know. We try. You know, when these dates come, you, you want to go to sleep on Chov Av, wake up on Chov Ches and miss it, you know. <laughs> That's how I used to feel. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I talk. Years ago, you wouldn't get me to make a speech like this on a day like this. No way. What am I going to say? What am I going to say? These are very important moments. They're very important moments. They're serious moments. They're moments that test, that challenge. But test and challenge is not just the chas shalom make us fail. You know, it's not there to give us permission for yish, for despair. <coughs> Tests and challenges, take it up with God. And last time I checked, he wasn't responding to these kinds of questions. He does what he wants. You know, the Rebbe always says that by a Rebbe, nothing happens. Anything happens to the Rebbe, the Rebbe the Rebbe, the Rebbe happens to the Rebbe's Rotson. But the, 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 this happened is a statement that the Rebbe felt that this is what needs to be. This is our test. This is our challenge. And of course, all of you have a, a Taina Tzedekes and a Tviya. You know, whether it's a or there's a Malkainu. What kind of Hasidus is this? What kind of Hasidus is this? Gimel Tamas, Gimel of Shloishim. In Tafshin Nundalat, Shloishim. Of Nundalat, Tafshin Nundalat, Shloishim after Gimel Tamas. There was a Fabrenian in 770. And Rabbi Groner spoke, Allah Rasha, Label Groner spoke, the secretary spoke. There was two times that all the secretaries, all of them, Rabbi Groner and Rabbi Klein and Rabbi Krinsky and uh, Rabbi Mendel Nistama and Rabbi uh, Simpson all spoke together. It happened a couple of times. And Rabbi Groner spoke. And Rabbi Groner told two stories about Shia Hecht. Have you heard of Shia Hecht? Yeah, there's a lot of Shia Hecht, right? This Avia voice of Shia Hechts, the source of all the Shia Hechts, was the father of all the Hecht brothers, right? Rabbi Shi, he passed away very young. He passed away in 1954. So Rabbi Leibel Groner told the following story. Rabbi Shia Hecht had six sons. The Friedrich ever called him Shisha Sidre Mishnes Roy, Moyed, Noshim, Mizik, and Kotim Tazan, Yankel Hecht. JJ Hecht used to boast, Am Nizikin. The Mazak had gemacht nicht schlecht. Um, but they're all big chassidim, very important Lubavitcher chassidim. And uh, Rabbi Shia came to 770 after the Friedrich Rebbe passed away. And he went into the Rebbe and he said to the Rebbe, I have questions and I can't know what to do. So the Rebbe said to Rabbi Shia, Rabbi Shia, do what I do. 
go upstairs. She had, I'm assuming, in 770, was a, he could go any place he wanted. He was, uh, he was probably very, very respected. Go upstairs, go into the Rebbe's cheder, and go over to the table where the Rebbe sat before Yud Shvat, and ask your questions. And the Rebbe told him, I do the same thing. So Rabbi Shia Hecht said to the Rebbe, Ich bin a Galiziane. I don't know about you Russians. I'm a Galizian Jew. But in the Galizia, I'm a Galizian Jew. I'm a Galizia. You understand? Mm-hmm. Where I come from, a Rebbe is a person, not a, not a, not a chair, not a, not a kisei. <laughs> so the Rebbe answered his questions. So you have a tiny, it's he was a Galizian, it's he was a Russian, it's a American, yeah? <laughs> The only Rebbe we know are chairs, huh? Um, <laughs> your Rebbe is a chair. It's a very holy chair, and that chair is so alive. Ah! Oh, right? Everybody knows that. You wouldn't be here if it wasn't. That chair is so alive. That chair is so alive. It's interesting to see how the Rebbe is becoming everybody's Rebbe. You know, everyone is realizing. I don't mean Lubavitchers. That the Rebbe is Reish B'nei Yisrael. I just saw a historian, a from guy, but a historian, who did an uh, uh, expose on three G'dayli Yisrael who were very hated during their lifetimes. And afterwards, people realized that they were Rabban Shal Kol B'nei Yisrael. And the third one was the Rebbe. He says, the Rebbe has become my Rebbe. Not, not, no means of the Babacher. Why you guy? You know, years ago, now the Rebbe was my Rebbe. I had this tiny to him and that. And I'm starting to realize that not he's my Rebbe, and I was always my Rebbe. He was always my Rebbe. And this person did research, and he's trying to understand the Rebbe, because it's his Rebbe. We're watching it happen. The Rebbe promised Mashiach, Kindalach. The Rebbe don't make no mistakes. Right? The Rebbe said, Bederach Nevua, Mashiach is coming, Mashiach is coming. Chas Shalom didn't even think that he tried. He didn't try. The Rebbe doesn't try. Other people try. The Rebbe gets it done. But then, unfortunately, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's difficult. It's so many years. It's so many years. So many years. So the question, you can ask it a hundred ways. The bottom line is it's hard, and it's frustrating, and it's depressing, and it's disappointing. And I would say that for young people like yourselves, the most acute question is, it's harder. It's harder to be a chzidish girl it's hard to be a chassidish wife, a chassidish woman, a chassidish mother. It's harder. It's harder. And I, I, think, I think it's accurate, although the fact of the matter is that the children are bigger chassidim than their parents. Trust me, I'm a parent. I got kids, right? She's a daughter. She has parents. The children are nicer than their parents, but that's another part of the weird kasha. How does this work? But it's tough. It's tough. It's very, very difficult to be a Lubavitcher chassid where the, it's a benkel. It's Lebedic. It's very alive. It's very, very alive. But, uh, you, you, you know, it's not the way it's meant to be. That's the question. What's the answer? A breda hatman? You have a choice. You have a choice. I'm asking, you have a breda. This is it. This is what the Eibishter gave us. Uh, you, you don't like the Eibishter? <laughs> They're not making another one. <laughs> <laughs> They're not making another So the ain't ain't like Abishter, and he knows he's got a monopoly on Abishter, so he can do whatever he wants. And Bechlal, he's pretty smart. This Abishter of ours, not only he's smart, he's also pretty good. No, but then he does things in such convoluted ways, and it's hard to understand. It's so hard to understand. It's so hard to understand. But this is the question. I, I walked out of the Bachim. So Rabbi, he said, the first question, are you for bringing it tonight? I said, yeah. <laughs> when? For the girls. <laughs> um, why are you bringing it for the boys? That's a different question. So one boy says to me, what's it if I bring about on Chavzai and other? I said, you have to understand my boys. It's, it's a funny question. I said, because Fabrengians are about avoidance Hashem. They're not just a party. We sit and eat and drink and be merry. And today is a very serious day to speak about Yanavid Hashem. From the other side of the room, I hear two Bachim saying, Nothing happened, Chazai and other. So his friend says, So we're going to have a bring about nothing. <laughs> and nothing is a lot. Nothing is an awful lot. It's an awful, awful lot. So if you came here to hear surprises, I got no surprises. To say what I just said in slightly different words, I'm just repeating myself. 
um, you want life to be fair. fair. I'm, I'm a good person. I'm fair. I want life to be fair. I tell my children all the time, fairness ends in kindergarten. If you're lucky. If you're lucky. <laughs> fairness is a, is a communist fantasy. That's what it is. It's a socialist that doesn't exist. The world's not fair. The world is not fair. And the world doesn't come to you. You got to go to the world, you know. There are some people who spend their entire lives waiting for the world to discover them. And sometimes the world does, but often it doesn't. And that's how they live. They're waiting for the world to say they're all disappointed. The whole world is stupid. I'm a genius. Nobody sees. I'm a great chazan. I'm a great artist. I'm a great dancer. I'm a great I don't know what that nobody knows. <laughs> that's not how life goes. You have to go to life. And the same is true with Hasidus. You know, I, I fluctuate myself, you know. We have a Rebbe. <laughs> Who we love so much, right? We love him. We love him. And when I say love him, I mean take a love him like you love a father, not just respect him and revere him. We love him. Um, to give you a case in point of loving the Rebbe, 41 years ago, I remember this event, and I spoke about it to the seminary, goes, there's nobody from seminary, right? Only post-seminary, yeah? <laughs> um, I remember when the Rebbe made Sivas Hashem. It was Tov Shim 1981. In other words, 41 years ago, this past Simcha The Rebbe announced Sivas Hashem Chalamet Sukkot. He wrote a letter, he fabrenged, he spoke to the children, he explained to them what an army is, and he had all kinds of rules. Shmini Atzeres, by HaKafes, the Rebbe turned around, after the fourth HaKaf, he spoke a Sikh. And he said that the fifth HaKaf, they're going to give to the newly formed Sivas Hashem, and their teachers, and their Malamd. So became very, very excited in 770. The children are getting our coffee with the Malam. And then two seconds later, we found out that the Rebbe is going himself. That the Rebbe is a Malamid of the children, and he's going to go dance with the kids. And now 770 was cuckoo. So Shemin Atzeres was Nishkasha. I mean, how many kids were in Shul? Some Chasteda, every child in Christ was in Shul. There were hundreds and hundreds of kids. And the Rebbe went again to that coffee. And the Rebbe spent 10 minutes making order. He made the Bacher move away. The Rebbe didn't start to dance until every child had a place. And then the Rebbe danced by himself with the kids. The Rebbe held the Sefer Ten, he danced. I remember the children. This one's holding on to his kapote. This one's holding on to his gadol. And they're looking at the Rebbe like their favorite uncle. Oh, oh, yeah, I, I was already in Tavshin Mem Alf. I just turned 15. My brother just turned four, had not yet been turned 14. We missed it by a year or two. Service Hashem. So the kids who were in that box were three years younger than I am. You know, I'm an old man. They're a little bit less old than me. <laughs> the older you get, the less these ages matter. So a guy says to me, he's three years younger than I am. He was 12. When the Rebbe finished dancing, the mood by the children was so exhilarating, was so wow, that they started shaking the Rebbe's hand. You don't shake the Rebbe's hand. They were like, the Rebbe was like a, there was such a closeness. The kids and the Rebbe loved each other. It was a love fest. And what's that, Rebbe? Rebbe's a kus. Rebbe's boring. There's no six flags. There's no ice skating. There's no ice cream in Matzah Shabbos. There's no pizza. The Rebbe's man doesn't eat, doesn't sleep, and doesn't let us eat, doesn't let us sleep. <laughs> and we love him. It's an interesting thing. What do we love? We love a Yid who doesn't give two hoots for everything that matters to us. How do I look? <laughs> Can I afford it? How am I going to make my money? It doesn't mean diddly squat. And we don't have a Psaza relationship. He's a holy guy, and you come and you stand. We love him. We have him And our children love him. Which means that we love a Lukus. We love Taira and Avoida. If you stop and you think about it, the Rebbe has no interest in how good the cookies taste, and how fresh the watermelon is, and how good the tomatoes are, and how good the pretzels are. It means nothing. 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 What matters? And we should learn a little more. We should have a makarathan at Svetin Yidin. And we love him. How do we love a person who's busy with stuff that's very, very important? <laughs> but come on. 
You have to be a mensch. We love it. That's the Chosid Rebbe relationship. That's what's so amazing about it. Which means a man who literally has nothing in common with us. Nothing. Nothing. Our thoughts and his thoughts are like the Abish of Nazareth. Mamish Leimach Shvesai Mach Shveseichem. But Chlal not. Like in the beginning of this week's Pasha, and Moshe and Betzalel, Moshe doesn't know how to speak, and Betzalel has to explain to him. Moshe didn't make no mistakes. Moshe speaks the way Moshe is supposed to speak, and Betzalel tells him, maybe you mean this. And Moshe says, you're right. So why didn't Moshe say it the way the first time? Because Moshe says how it is, Lamaila. And Betzalel tells him, but Lamata has to be like this. Yeah, yeah, Taka, Lamata has to be like this. Now, now here goes the, the fine print. But I wasn't going to tell it to you. You're going to have to figure that out because I gave it to you how it is, Lamaila, and you have to bring it down how it is, Lamata. You see, we have a connection to such a man. And somehow, the connection is not just reverence and fear and awe and respect. It's Parshat Ava, Lipshaft, love. And this relationship, Kindelach, gives us energy, it gives us purpose. And it kicks us in the pants. It makes us work. And this is, of course, the point of it all. Like I said to you, whatever question you want to ask, this, the answer is going to be the same. There's work to do. We've got to do it. Each one of us. To, to be a healthy human being, do not wait for life to come to you. Go to life. That's the way it works. If you wait for life to come to you, it's going to land on your head. And you'll, <laughs> you have to go to life. Meaning, each, you, I mean, each person can hold in this room, just marry boys that deserve you. That's the only bracha. Not more. That's, a, that's enough. That's enough. Just marry a boy who deserves each one of you. Beautiful And you should have health. And you should have shalom. And you should have kidney. And you should have panasa. And you should have shlichas. And you should have atzlacha. You should have all the brachas. I mean it. Mikolalev. Mit ganznatz. And take her from a yad mamish. No, but Amish, Amish, Amish can, as I will can, Amish can do whatever he wants. <laughs> like they're not making another one, but this one is not bad, yeah. As I will can it, as I can will it, but I always feel my mamish. Wait, so you're all in different stages in your life, but whatever stage you're in, um, I saw a film, a guy from Australia, what's his name? A very, very important rabbi, who was the principal of the school for many, many years. Somebody help me. In Australia, not the girls' school, the, the yeshiva college, the boys. Rabbi Glick. Rabbi Glick got married, and the Rebbe sent him on Shlichis to Worcester, Massachusetts. This is going back 50 years, almost 50 years. Now, he didn't know the Rebbe's plan, and the Rebbe did not tell him, but he realized later that the Rebbe always intended for him to move to Australia. <coughs> they were always intended for him to move to Australia. And is it him that after he moved, his in-laws moved, his wife's parents moved to be with them? Is it him? Does that make sense? Anybody here from Australia? Yeah, I didn't know that. Ah? Yeah, I just don't know that. But I, I, one of the Austra- I think it's him. His, his wife is a Krinsky. They, they moved to Australia and the parents said, what about our kids? And they moved. I heard a story in Italy. There's a, a Krinsky couple lived in Boston. One of the daughters married a year, the Rebbe said, the Shlichas to Melbourne, and the Rebbe said, he's going on Shlichas, you want to be with your kids? Move. So they moved to Australia. Moved to Australia. I think it's hysterical. <laughs> um, <laughs> it makes complete sense if the Rebbe runs the world. That's it. That's main. <laughs> so he was went to, to Worcester, Massachusetts. The Rebbe always planned for him to move to Australia, but intermittently, whatever the Cheshboi Nassar, this is Rebbe's Gezach, and the Rebbe wanted them in New Haven. And then they got a really funny answer. They should move to Australia, but not now. They should wait till after Yom Tov. They should wait till after Yom Tov. So you saw this movie, Rabbi Glick does it on the gem. It was Nit Lang, they, recently they showed this film. That, uh, he says, it was like really strange. The Rebbe says to me, I'm moving to Australia after Yom Tov. So I got four months, five months, I'm going to do five months, I'm going to close up shop. You had the Shlichus. In, New, in uh, Worcester. And the Rebbe tells him he's leaving, but not today, after Yom Tov. So he doesn't know what to do, but at some point in the Yechidus, he somehow musters the courage. And he says, so what am I supposed to do for the next five months? And the Rebbe looks at him. I, I don't know what, what you for five months, but are you going to sit down and do nothing? Five months, use every minute. I forgot how the Rebbe worded it, but the Rebbe said, really? 
Because in five months you're moving to Australia, so the next five months you have nothing to do? Come on, what kind of life is that? Use every moment, the next five months, to fulfill complete the Shlichas in Worcester before you move to Melbourne. So this is our deal. Our deal is, so Mr. you're going to become a caller next week, you're going to become a next month, you're going to next month in a day, you're going to become a for Pesach, thank you, Yom Rishad of David. Um, but you have to chap right? right? This is how we, we're chassidim. That's what chassidim do. Chassidim are busy. They work, they do. And they have simcha. This is the truth. Complaints, you're right. That's it. Don't even, you're, you're right. I'm right. You're right. We're all right. I'll tell you a nice story about complaints. A wonderful story about complaints. Uh, but it's not going to help you the story because it's <laughs> they complaints. It. It's not going to end the way you want it to. No one can say, "Yeah, I feel bad for you. I'll give you a hug and we'll empathize and say from now on for the rest of your life you're part of more mitzvahs because you had tzachmanos in you." That's not how this story ends. I heard the story from Rabbi Grumblat, Harav Tzvi Grumblat, who's a tzaddik, a yid, a shliach, the Rebbe, the shliach, the Rebbe to Argentina. When the Sars, Argentina, he went on shliachus when Rabbi. Baumgarten passed away suddenly. Harav Benel Baumgarten is avek mitamo passed away in 1978. He was still a bocher, and the Rebbe basically told him, get married and go on shlichus. And he doesn't even know how, but he found his wife. He got married. He went on shlichus. Um, so he was very close to Benel Baumgarten. Benel Baumgarten was makad of him. So Rabbi Benel Baumgarten, who was a Rebbe shlich in, in Argentina for 15 years, told him the following story. He, he was a tzaddik. I, I, I knew non Lubavitchers who knew him. They said, this man was a tzaddik. He was a very chassidish yid. But Panasa, not his middle name. He'd never had any money. He was able to help other people, but he himself didn't have two nickels. He said he was so poor that he couldn't afford to buy meat. He used to buy bones and cook it. And he, this was the only flesh he had. He couldn't afford to buy flesh. And he was, he was hard. He was alone. Anyway, he was one of those chassidim who told the Rebbe everything. You know, there's two types of chassidim. The chassidim told the Rebbe nothing, and the chassidim told the Rebbe. I think he wrote to the Rebbe every single day of his life. Every single day. And if he missed a day, the Rebbe said what happened to the letter. He wrote every day, every single day. If you write to the Rebbe every single day, you know what happens? You never do an Aveda. Never. There's no opportunity. <laughs> it's Machzach Every single day. Every, not once a week. Not one. Every day. And he must have complained. He told the Rebbe how he felt. He hated the fact that he was away from the Rebbe. He needed to be near the Rebbe. And he hated the fact that he was so impoverished. So he was in Yechidus by the Rebbe. And I don't know if he wrote it in that note or he wrote it in a different note. This is how Rabbi Grunblat has been able to tell the mice. I heard from Rabbi Grunblat, and Rabbi Grunblat heard it from Harav Baumgarten, with whom the story occurred. The Rebbe used to use a pencil in Yechidus, not a pen, a pencil. And the Rebbe was holding the pencil in his hand, and he was reading Bedel's note, Rabbi Baumgarten's note. It was a very big chassid. And the Rebbe throws the pencil down on the table. And says in English, No more complaints. <laughs> in English. And then the Rebbe said, he, he probably had no money. He had no money. He had nothing to eat. No more complaints. Du You're going to travel back. And you're going to go back happily. You're not going to go back to Argentina happy because I told you to go back to Argentina happy. You're going to go back to Argentina happy because you're happy. That's it. That was the statement. No more complaints. Stop it. You're going to go back and you're going to be simcha and you're going to do it not for me but for yourself. Shoin. End of story. The next day, Rabbi Chadikov called him in, the Rebbe's secretary, and Rabbi Chadikov told him that from then on, the Rebbe was going to send him Parnasa every month. He should have what to eat. The Rebbe sent him Parnasa. The Rebbe sent him what he needed. In Yechidus, the Rebbe didn't tell him, I'm going to send you a check. This, this was business, you understand. <laughs> Yechidus was Pnimius. Yechidus was Ruchnius. No more complaints. Are we entitled to complain? Ooh. Are we entitled to complain? Oh, are we entitled to complain? But the, the, so the, the tightness or tightness, whatever the tightness is, the tennis and the silver. We're gathered here, and I bless you all for coming, and I thank the organizers, and whatever else you have to say that's nice and correct. I said it. You hear it like as if I said it. You came here because you're Chassidisha girls, and you want to participate for bringing Chavzayin, it's a, it's a moment in our calendar that has to be marked. 
it's a serious moment. It's a, it's a, I, don't know, I don't know if sad works. It's an emotional moment. It's an emotional moment. And we are here to take something from it. And this is the bottom line. This is who we are, girls. This is who we are. It's hard for everybody. And in Hashem, you get married, yeah? You have a husband, it's going to get harder. <laughs> You'll have kids, it's going to get even harder. You're going to have more kids, it's going to get even, even harder. The kids are going to go to school, it's going to get even, even, even harder. At what point does the even become odd, yeah? And then the kids are going to get big, yeah? But you know what? That's life. All the brachas. I, I'm a little bit ahead of you guys, right? My children are your age and older and younger. I say, I have a lot of problems in my life, but every single one of my problems comes from a bracha. You take one of my brachas, Rachmona, Litzan, Hoy, you have a lot less problems. That's the deal, girls. We have so many brachas, but the brachas are hard. Life is hard. Shlichas is also a bracha. You know, shlichas is a bracha. Working for the Rebbe is a bracha. Being involved in spending your entire adult life helping other yidin be yidin is a bracha. And it has its tests. It has its challenges. No question about it. Right? It's the way it is. And this is who we are. And we have to find within ourselves joy, koyach, to do this, besimcha, that our hiskashas to the Rebbe should be real. I know that part of the hiskashas is the hergish, no doubt about it. The hiskashas is very much how we feel. But we know, all of us know. You want to be connected to the Rebbe? Do an action. You want to be more connected to the Rebbe? Do two actions. You want to be even more connected to the Rebbe? Do three actions. You want to be even, even with four. It's very simple. I know it. My business, I'm a very lucky man. I spend my life teaching Hasidus. I don't get answers in Igris, I don't. The Rebbe doesn't come to me in dreams. <laughs> After Gimel Thomas, Mamish, the beginning, I dreamt the Rebbe every night. And then it stopped. And I, I, I think I know why. That's none of your business. <laughs> you know where the Rebbe is? In my teaching. The Rebbe puts words in my mouth all the time. I'm telling you, sometimes I give a class and I, 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 didn't, I didn't give this class. I didn't prepare it, didn't give it. I don't know where the ideas came from. In your work, you see the Rebbe. In your actions, you see the Rebbe. Each one of us. This is called the Hiskashas, the real Hiskashas. But we, this is what the Rebbe gave us. The Rebbe made it very simple. Just do good stuff. All the feelings, all the ruchnias will follow. Do, do, and do it with joy. And then Hashem will help that our lives will be meaningful and optimistic and uplifting and positive and healthy and blessed and all the wonderful things I said before. So this is a, a, a word about Chavzai in Adarishin. I mean, I could, you know, I could go over the details of the events, but uh, first of all, I don't even know if I know them correctly. Did you know that the night before the Rebbe asked to see a doctor, did you know this? Did you know this? Chavzai, you know, there was Monday. Sunday night, I had in the base Mashiach magazine, the Rebbe asked to see Dr. Feldman. Did you know that? Did anybody know that? The Rebbe wanted to see the doctor. The Rebbe wasn't feeling well. And the doctor told the Rebbe, don't go to the oil. I'm finished with base yeah. Mashiach. <laughs> and the Raya Samus, yeah. And the Rebbe said, so what are the Chassidim going to say? The Rebbe talked to well, Dr. Feldman, don't go to the oil. The Rebbe wasn't feeling well. But this is the way it is. This is the way it is. Like I said, I could tell you what happened the next couple of years. It was crazy. It was very crazy. Now it was also crazy, but it's a different crazy. Then it was crazy, crazy. You know, let me tell you one more thing on this on this tabring and note. I'll tell you one more thing. I I talked to my boys in yeshiva. I'll share it with you. There's a story with the Rebbe Ditzah Machzerek. There's, there's many stories that make this point, but this story that makes the following point is our life. There's a story with the Rebbe Ditzah Machzerek. Ditzah Machzerek was a very big Rebbe. They say that he had a million chassidim. That means half the Jews in Russia were shame like half the Jews in Russia they, they uh, learned Tanya, they, they, they went to the Fabrenga Nishin Yutas Kislev, they sat by the chassidim on Friday night, they were shot for the Shalashudis, they went to Mlava Malkas, they did all the Chsidisha things. And yet, by the Tzamach the Yechidus was chaos. By the Tzamach Yechidus was chaos. How was Yechidus? You came and you pushed. Yechidus was on a clock. The Tzamach Tzadik allotted two hours for Yechidus, or three hours for Yechidus. So 50 people came, 50 people couldn't go in in two hours. You fought. 
You know, in the Lashna Gemara, whoever's stronger, called the Alam Gvad, and usually the guys who were stronger were probably less Yiddish also. And you pushed your way in, and when they, a lot of time was up, the Shami said, I'm sorry, come back tomorrow, end the story. And it really wasn't becoming it. The Rebbe Semach Tzedek should have people standing outside his room fighting every night to get into the Rebbe. So somebody said to the Semach Tzedek, Rebbe, you hey, look at Rebbe. Why don't you put a secretary at the door and make a list and people don't have to fight and, uh, and maybe normal? Well, the Rebbe, that's how it was. There was someone standing by the door. His name was Rabbi Groner. I read in his biography now. I told the girls in school that a guy was waiting in line for Yechidis. He got very upset. He hit him. He hit Label. He gave him a patch. He hit him. There were people who wanted to string him up. They hated Label Groner. Why? Because he was doing his job and his job wasn't an easy job. <laughs> Rabbi Chadikov went into the Rebbe and told the Rebbe. Rabbi Chadikov told the Rebbe that someone hit Label. Rabbi Chadikov told the Rebbe. And I felt, I think Rabbi understood that if he doesn't protect Groner, they'll take and kill him. <laughs> <laughs> the Rebbe made the man apologize. The Rebbe told this man he must apologize. The Rebbe asked Rabbi Groner what happened. So Rabbi Groner told him. And the Rebbe asked, Rabbi Groner, did you see that when this man hit you, his wife was crying? He lost himself. I mean, you don't hit the Rebbe's secretary. He got upset. His wife was crying. So he said, no, I didn't see that his wife was crying. And the Rebbe asked him, were you upset when he hit you? So Label said no. I mean, he's used to it. He was a, he, he was a, he was a dartboarder for curses and for other <laughs> kinds of wonderful Jewish epithets. So the Rebbe asked him, were you angry? He, sa he said no. And the Rebbe, the Rebbe smart, was very happy that he, as they say in America, didn't take it personally. Anyway, but at least it was a list. <laughs> it could have been a, a lot worse. But a shoving match. So somebody says to the Rebbe, the Tzemach Tzedek, Rebbe, you, why don't you make a Seder for Yechidus? So the Tzemach Tzedek said, I'm going to say it in Yiddish. And I'll translate it in English afterwards. Tzemach Tzedek said the following. Oda kum teinir vas ich daf em mer vi er mir und er stupt sach und stupt sach und stupt sach bis er kum zu zum Tier und mich stupt immer bis in Wand. Und er stupt sach und er stupt sach und er stupt sach bis er kum zu zum Tier und mich stupt immer bis in Wand. Und er stupt sach und er stupt sach und er stupt sach bis er geht zu mir rein und er fahrt daf ich am sach soll sach stupen. Ihr understand Yiddish? He says, there's somebody who comes here who I need him more than he needs me. I don't know what that means. The Tzadik Nister, a, a bit of the The Rebbe was a year that the Rebbe needed. The Tzadik Nister, I need him more than he needs me. So he comes. And he pushes and pushes and pushes. He comes to the door and then they send him flying. So he pushes and pushes and pushes and pushes to the door. They send him flying again. And he pushes and pushes. And he finally gets into me. He says, I need this whole chaos that that Jew should get into me. That's some sort of the f I need the chaos because this Jew would never come otherwise. It'd be a say that he wouldn't put himself on the list. He only gets in because nobody sees that he's getting in. This is our life. This is our life. Our life is chaos, right? Um, we're, we're right now, at this particular moment, witnessing a, a very disturbing event that's happening far away but it's not far at all uh, I'll tell you one of the sweetest things when the war started it was before Shabbos right before Shabbos Thursday as I come to Yeshiva the Bochem cut collecting I saw teach Chassidus instead we talk about politics so we had a whole conversation about Russia and about Putin but don't ask you one of the people who works by <coughs> yeshiva shows up in yeshiva and he's much more down to earth than I am. He's up to date. Uh, he told me he doesn't follow politics either and I believe him. But uh, he's, he's, a, he's a cooler cleverer man than I am. He's on the ball. He doesn't live uh, in, uh, in La La Land, in Dreamland. So I said to him, Do what is, what's going to happen? <coughs> Without a hesitation, he tells me, miracles are going to happen. I don't know how, but miracles are going to happen. Now you have to know this person. He's very reasonable. He's very practical. He's not the. He's not the. He's not a la la kind of chassid. He's a. He struggles with chassidus. Faket. He's so realistic. I was so surprised by his response. He says, "Ask me why I said that. <laughs> Ask me why I said 
I said, okay, why did you say it? He <coughs> says, the guy, is, he's my student. Now we work together. He's 25 years younger than I am. He's a boy. He's closer to yours than to mine. He says, listen, how did I grow up? Every year or two, they told me, now the world is going to be destroyed. And it didn't happen. And he went through a list in his lifetime of events where the whole world was supposed to plot and it didn't happen. And when, it, when it's happening, saying, I'm telling you this time, we're not getting out of it. And then it passes like nothing. And what do we say? We made a mistake. Nobody ever says that Abish to made a nest. He says, I grew up with this. So I no longer resist when something happens. What's going to happen? Miracles. I don't know how. Miracles. And he attributed it to me when I was his mashpia many years ago. I guess I must have been a chassid shidam. I look at Zayden because I used to fabrenga. Yeah, I mean, uh, whatever. I, I I was so jealous of him. It was such a simple approach. We we live in a in a nutty world. It's a mishagoyim. It's like the chassidim standing out there, times and pushing. But there's miracles all around us. Miracles all around us, but we don't see them. You know, this is all the fabrenga that we had Thursday morning instead of learning chassidus. In 1991, which is 30 years ago, there was a Gulf War, right? You heard about 31 years of the Gulf War. You remember the Gulf War? You heard about the Gulf War, yeah? How many scars landed in Israel? 38. How many people died? Zero. Oh, not from the scars, zero. And wow, I'm in the Kness. Unbelievable miracle, right? Oh, impressed? Yes or no? Yeah. A few years ago, 4,000. 4,000, 4, 000, 4 000 rockets landed in Israel, not from Iraq, from Gaza. The warning time was 12 seconds. 4,000 rockets on Israel, 4,000. Oh, the Iron Dome! How many rockets broke through the Iron Dome? Just a few hundred, right? Now, how many rockets hit Israel in 1991? Well, by the way, they also had Patriot batteries then, also they had an Iron Dome then. 38, it's a big nest. I'm asking you a question. 38 rockets hit at Yisrael, and there was an Iron Dome then also. There was the Patriot belt, which pulled out, which blew up many of the missiles in the air. It's the biggest miracle. You remember this. 4,000 rockets are shot from Gaza. A few hundred breaks of the Iron Dome. There is zero loss of life. How come we're not saying, wow, it's in this? Okay, that's, that's, a pretty, that's, that's not bad. It's a pretty good answer. The, the correct answer, according to me, is because the Rebbe is not showing us. That's all. There's miracles all around us. But cuckoo, it's nuts. It's a mess. It's such a mess. It's such a mess. But in the middle of this mess, there's life. In the middle of this mess, there's somehow stuff happening. And in Mitzvah Hashem, we'll be zeichet to see. There's galas, the gila, the geula. It should be clear, it should be simple, and it should be easy. So this is the world we live in. And what do we got to do? What we can what we can we have to live our lives like chassidim like chassidim with energy and with joy and with dedication and the rest is up to the Ibishter. and he's okay like I said before they're not changing him not, you can't replace him and he's not bad unless I have basically my cynical old friends the guys who are even older than I say Mashiach's not coming I say why he's enjoying himself too much I mean Okay. Now, the boy said, girls, I just, I, 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 I had a fabrengen with you. And this is really, I think that jokes aside, that what we just did is very important. It was, I, I didn't say any divrei teira, I didn't say any chedushim, I told you what you already know. But I think this is what I needed to say, and I think this is what you came to hear. If I disappointed you, I'm sorry. So now I'll say something a little bit more formal, okay, the rest of the time. I told you, I have two parts to the speech. I'm doing the second part first. And I believe that I did it. Raised that I shall, I did it. Now I'm doing the first part second. You probably ask yourself all the time how we lived all this. How your fathers, how your mothers lived this. So I'm going to tell you how we lived it. I'll tell you how we lived it. The cloud when you're around the Rebbe, you're used to miracles. Every word out of the Rebbe's mouth, every word of the Rebbe's mouth was a miracle. Every motion of the Rebbe's hand was a miracle. Mamish uh, alakus. 
it's not a guzma, it's not exaggerated, it's a fact, it's a fact. And in many cases, you know the stories that corroborate these facts. Every new over the Rebbe was a lakus, was, was a lakus. We brought the Abish into the world and changed Teva and helped people. No doubt about it. But the Rebbe, like all great tzaddikim, has a habit, has a derech, of everything being very tzniyistic. Everything is wrapped so neatly, yeah? We tell the Rebbe, the Rebbe made a nest. And no, it wasn't a nest. Yeah, the Fiedic Rebbe made it. The Ebishta did it. A hundred and one reasons why it's not a nest. And he didn't do it. There's a tzniyist. The, the Rebbe's a lakus, but he's so tightly packed, so neatly as a eingewickelt. Uh, that it looks normal. It looks like a regular person. And there's absolutely nothing regular about it. Nothing, nothing, nothing. But in any case, in Tov Shemem Test, 1989, Shavuos, <coughs> the Rebbe announces that the next year, Tov Shin Nun, is Tehei Shnas Nisan. The abbreviation for Tov Shin Nun is Tehei Shnas Nisan. It'll be a year of miracles. And the Rebbe said, why am I telling it to you now? It's Shavuos, four months' notice. Because people have to print calendars, and printing calendars has to be done before. So I'm giving you notice, you should know when you print your calendar, that this year, Tav Shinun is the Hei Shnas Nisa, the year of miracles. And the Rebbe didn't say it once, he kept on saying it, next will be a year of miracles. And that's exactly what happened. Between Shavuos Memtes and the stroke, <coughs> which is a little bit less than three years, if you were Lubavitcher and you were around Crown Heights and around 770, it was like living in Disneyland. It was a carnival of Nisim and Flies. A carnival. A carnival of Nisim and Flies. A carnival. Mamish, non-stop miracles. I always tell people, the, the New York Times, the New York Times is not a Hasidic paper. <laughs> the New York Times is kefir. They don't believe in They're kal to mention. Cold, cold non-believers. The New York Times had a headline in the winter of Tafshin and Bays. The latest miracle. That was the head. New York Times had the latest miracle. What was the miracle? That in Etisrael the Kinnet was dropping. There was no water. The Kinnet was dropping, it was disappearing. And if, if you've been to Israel, you know how serious that is. <coughs> I remember I remember the Fabrengen. It was Chesh and Nun Beis. They have a mention that they passing new. <laughs> there should be water in Etisrael. It rained for five days straight. The Kinnet was overflowing. So the New York Times had a headline The Latest Miracle. Now, uh, since when does the in the New York Times miracles not in their English? It's not part of their lexicon. That was a language of 770. And the New York Times editor put that in the headline because the language of 770 was the language of the world. It was a period of of incredible miracles. Incredible miracles. The miracle that everybody talks about is the mice with the Gulf, which is incredible. Takamoidendik. The Gulf War starts and the scuds start falling. I mean, the stories with the scuds are crazy. You know, the stories with the scuds, yeah. I'll just give you examples. There's, there's a number of examples. A four-story building, a four-story building, four floors, one, two, three, four, vertically, four-story building, took a direct hit from a scud, a direct hit. Half the building was cut away like a piece of birthday cake. Like, you know, you take a piece of cake, cut, and plops, you know, one piece falls. A half building cut, and you could see the doors the doors to where the room was that was now gone was still there. Every single person in every single floor in every single apartment in that building was on the side that remained standing. Every single one. Amoifus, a ness. See, so when it happens once you say, wow, but at a certain point it's like, I, I remember then thinking that this is, how, this is what the Makas must have felt like. <laughs> The, the, in time at 10 makas, you know, there was a break between a maka and a maka, yeah? But I, at some point, you become drunk. There was miracle after mi- It was unreal. We used to go speak in the shuls after the fabrengens. They were every Shabbos. Fabrengens started around 2 o'clock, quarter to 2. And the fabrengens were very short. 3.15 fabrengens were over. And in the winter, we had time to walk to shuls because the fabrengens finished early. They were standing on the street corners. What's the Rebbe looked hand? Everybody wanted to know during that Gulf War. Because whatever the Rebbe said happened, whatever the Rebbe said happened, whatever the Rebbe said happened. If, you, if you're familiar, the Rebbe spoke yesterday about Botsra, about Botsra. Botsra is northern Iraq. 
and all things that the Chalakim Bebotza, I can't say it's Bebotza, Basra as it's called in English. And nothing happened in Bebotza. It was a big kasha. They spoke a whole thing about Bebotza. After Shabbos, the Rebbe said to bury the Sikha. And he added the words, It'll happen. Ten years later was Nacha Gulf War, and the Taka happened. <laughs> the Rebbe spoke a Sikha like as if it happened. He was describing events that happened ten years later. Bemuchash, Bechush, Bechush. But that wasn't the big miracle. That was the miracle that the Rebbe talked about a lot. The big miracle was Russia. The big miracle was Russia. Russia was terrible. It's a terrible country. Terrible country. And Russia was a garrison was a garrison. You know, you couldn't get into Russia and Yeti Vemba. You lived in Russia, you couldn't get out. You as a Russia, you couldn't get in. So here's a story, okay? I tried this on for size. Okay, listen to this. And again, I'm not telling you a story they read about in books. I remember this. I lived this. The Rebbe fabrenged every year the night before Rosh Hashanah. The Rebbe fabrenged every year the night before Rosh Hashanah. Officially with the Tzemach Tzedek Siyemaledes. It was really also a Rosh Hashanah Dika Fabreng. In that Fabreng of the night before Rosh Hashanah, the Rebbe would say a Maim Echsidas. They would say a Maim always. With a Nigm. And it was considered a Rosh Hashanah Dika Maim Er. A Rosh Hashanah Dika Maim So one year in that Fabreng, the Rebbe told a story. What was the story the Rebbe told? The story that the Rebbe told was of the Tzemach Tzedek, like Praven, Paratkes, and Peterburg. What that means, Paratkes, and everything Russian. Tzemach Tzedek used to play musical chairs in Peterburg. What does that mean? The Rabbeim did not speak at all. You know, the Rabbeim, the first 20 of Rosh Hashanah, did not speak at all. Besides for davening and learning until, they didn't speak at all. Tzemach Tzedek also didn't speak the first 20 of Rosh Hashanah. But every once in a while, he broke his own rule and he did speak. If the Tzemach Tzedek spoke the first night of Rosh Hashanah by his table, with his family sitting around him, what did he talk about? What's the most important thing in the world? Take a wild guess. Kabbalah Samalchus, Bittl, Hat, Kieshevet. He spoke about Russian politics. <laughs> he would sit by his table and he would talk about, well, what did he say? He says, this guy, I don't like him. Let's get rid of him. That guy, he's a good guy. They should move him up to a different position. And he would talk about different leaders in the Russian government. And he'd move him around. This guy should get fired. And this guy should get hired. And this guy should get a better job. Uh, whatever the Tzemach Tzedek said by his table the night of Rosh Hashanah happened that year. I also took politics Rosh Hashanah by night. But it doesn't work. Yes, it's not. <laughs> the Tzemach Tzedek, whatever he said by his table happened by Pell Mamish. Now, the Rebbe just told the story. The Rebbe didn't say what politics. He didn't move the furniture. He just said Tzemach Tzedek used to move the furniture. So the first time it happened, I was by mitzvah. I was just 13. I don't remember it. It was Lamites. I, I just turned 14. Huh? The Rebbe told the story. And Brezhnev died. You've heard of Brezhnev? Yeah. He was called Deitant. He ruled the Soviet Union from 1963 when they kicked out Khrushchev until he dropped dead in 1979. And they put another leader in. I remember I was a little child. In those days I took politics very seriously. I had to know everything. Now I talk and know I should know, but I don't know what not, I don't know what my vice president's name is. The president, I think you know, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm not such a battling. They put in his place an old man, a big oaf of a goy. His name was Chenyenko. He was must have been six foot seven, but probably four hundred pounds, a big massive goy. And he was part of the old school, the old guard, the Politburo. So, okay, good. We knew nothing about him, an alter goy. Two years later, or three years later, not very long after, guess what happened? The Rebbe told the story again. Yeah, don't say again. <laughs> what do you think happened next? He died. <laughs> and they got another old leader. His name was Andropov. I remember Andropov. He had silver rimmed glasses. He was only 75. He was in pretty good health. He was the KGB head. He lasted two years. What do you think happened next? They were told to say again. You know what happened next? He died. Now you have to understand. I'm in 770. I'm a Bachar. It's a Rosh Hashanah. And you know how Fabrengen's worked? Officially the Rebbe was talking about a topic. Whatever he's talking about. But in the middle of his Sikhs, the Rebbe used to throw in Derech Agavs. He would throw in all kinds of things tangentially. There was no mistakes. The Rebbe had a lot of things to say. 
and during the course of the Fabreng, and whatever needed to be said was said. So just try to picture this. The Rebbe is speaking about whatever topic it is, and somehow in the middle of one of the Sikhs, the Rebbe says, the first time it happened, it was okay. But after a couple of times, the whole room is smiling. The whole 770 knows somebody important is going to die. <laughs> Imagine if we had an Isaychel. You're sitting with a Yid who's literally running the world. I, 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 I know it sounds radical and Lubavitch and closed minded, but it's also true. Huh? Anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism. Wait one second. Wait one second. Gorbachev comes to power. Gorbachev comes to power. 1985. And again, again, I don't know how much you know, but for those few years, between 1980 and 1985, the Rebbe kept on saying, the Rebbe kept on saying, the the world, the world is shaking, the world is shaking. The Rebbe made fast. We fasted a bunch of times. No one knew what was talking about. And then as soon as Gorbachev came to power, stopped, never said it again. The world's not shaking anymore. The Rebbe called in Brownover the same day. And he says, call up our people in Russia and tell them that their lives are going to improve now. So he called them up. They were afraid to talk to him. Gorbachev was not an old man. He was in his 50s. And they expected him to be another Stalin. They expected him to be so brutal, so Russia, so schlecht. And they get a message from the Rebbe. Rebbe calls them up and says, the Rebbe, however they speak on the phone, the codes that they used, Obviously, he didn't say Yishal Malech and Lubavitcher Chosid, Lubavitcher Rebbe. It was spoken, however you speak, the Yid in Russia in those days. And they told Branov, that's not what we see. We're afraid. We're circling the wagons. We're afraid. How quickly did it change? Overnight. Gorbachev was afraid of economy, of economic stuff. He couldn't keep up with America. You ever heard, maybe you heard this, was called a cold war, right? Cold wars are real wars. But trust me, a cold war is a lot more geschmack than a hot one. Trust me. But cold wars are wars. And Cold Wars are one, and the factories, machines who build bigger bombs, better kli hashchosa, bigger tools to destroy the world, to kill people. And um, Russia was losing the Cold War; they couldn't keep up. Their economy collapsed, so they had to make money, so they had to give people opportunities. So they made glasnost and perestroika. One of them means private enterprise; people can have their own businesses a little bit. Doesn't not everything has to be owned by the government, mamish, and um, perestroika. One word means free enterprise, and the other word means that you can actually criticize the government, which is a Kiddush. In Russia, you were not allowed to criticize the government. They were giving people opportunity to say what they wanted. He came to power for Pesach. You know, Tavshin Memhei. By Tavshin and Beis, he was gone. Fini. Over. What happened? Very quickly, Russia opened up. Very quickly. Very quickly. It changed very fast. Five, six years. Everything changed. We started visiting Russia. We stopped being afraid. The Rebbe was upset that we were not afraid. The Rebbe wanted us to be afraid. There's a lot of details, a lot of stories. Not everything is for now. What do you think the Rebbe wanted us to do? didn't trust the communists. The Rebbe didn't trust them. Till the day it was over. We were thinking it's no big deal. The Rebbe was upset. The, I mean, Abba was arrested. And the Rebbe said, This is the late 80s. The Rebbe did not trust them for a minute. Not for a second. He knew them can't squat the Rebbe, you know what I'm saying? He didn't forget. Anyway, the summer of 1991, tough shit enough, summer of 1991, three events converged, happened together in a few days, mamish. And to me, the convergence of these three events is, is not earth shattering, it's the heavens are shaking. The first event is Shabbos Pasha Shoiftim Tinosis. Anybody know about that Fabrengen? Anybody here? Shabbos Pasha Shoiftim Tafshim Nalf. Anybody know about that Fabrengen? Huh? Nobody knows? Yes. Thank you. Shikoyach. That Fabrengen, I was there. You can't forget it. They ever spoke about Nevoa. And they ever spoke about himself. And they spoke about Mashiach. The Rebbe used Oasis about that, that Fabrengen, which you never heard before or after, about prophecy, about the Rebbe being a Navi. It's a Shabbos. Monday night, the riots started in Crown Heights. The Rebbe came back for the oil and an African-American child was killed and they started the riots in Crown Heights. Tuesday morning, we wake up to the news that Gorbachev was overthrown. Gorbachev went on vacation to the Crimea 
and they arrested him and his wife and his children and the hard lighters took over Russia. Okay, let me repeat these three events. Shabbos, the Rebbe spoke of Shaftim. If I had more time, I would explain it to you. I'm very surprised that you don't know about it. Monday night, the riot started in Crown Heights. The fighting, they were killing, it was Kfelech. They killed the Yid in the streets. Tuesday morning, the, the, the uh, coup d'etat starts in Russia. Now you must understand, when we woke up on that Tuesday morning and heard that in Russia there was a coup and they overthrew Gorbachev and the streets of Moscow were filled with tanks, what were we thinking? World War III, no question about it. Two years before, in 1989, in China, in a place called Tiananmen Square, students protested for human rights. Students in China. In Ti Tiananmen Square is the Chinese equivalent of what's called in Russia, in Moscow, the Red Square. If you heard of the Red Square. Yeah, you heard of the Red Square? Yeah. In five minutes, the Chinese miracle, military came in and they murdered 3,000 students. Five minutes. Like, like a cut guy. So you see how, val how much the Chinese, the communist Chinese, value their own citizens. Other countries, Ms. Tama, they value more, but their own citizens, not so much. We can afford it. They have a few extra, yeah? At least Dr. Nadeg in China. So when the Gorbachev was arrested and the streets of Moscow filled with tanks, we expected that those tankists are going to shoot to kill and anybody who goes out of his house, they're going to kill him. And it's going to become an authoritarian state and go back to the same darkness that we had for 70 years. The people came out onto the streets, they climbed up onto the tanks and they sang Ovaratsta. I mean, they didn't sing Ovaratsta, whatever they sang in Russian, yeah? And they held white flags. The tankists, Russian soldiers, refused to shoot. Not a single bullet. By Thursday, those Alta Fifers were in jail and Gorbachev was back in Moscow. He comes back to Moscow and he makes an announcement that he's making a referendum for the dissolution of the Union, to split apart the Soviet Union into 15 states. And but there was, a, there was a referendum. Everybody got to vote. And they voted for the dissolution of the Union and it became 15 different countries and Nebuchadnezzar Putin is trying to do tshuva <laughs> and reunite with the Ukraine. They shall fear for good nation. So I'm good by Alamein, not by Yidin, by Alamein, by Yidin special. Yidin yadrein o nene. So here's an interesting thing. Between Tuesday morning and Thursday afternoon is three days. I cannot tell you. It was unspoken. We didn't talk about it, how nervous we were. I grew up, the Soviet Union was like the moon. My father had first cousins in Russia. You know, that's first cousins. Never spoke to them on the phone, never. It was like a different universe. It was so far away. The thought of Russia becoming dark again was something that I could relate to and it was concerning me. It was very upsetting. Now here's the story. That summer, all over Russia, there were camps. There were camps from the Aguda, there were camps from the Mizrahi, there were camps from the Tsiyoinim, there were camps from the Reform, there were camps from the Conservative, there were camps from the Bnei Bris, and camps from the, what do they call themselves? The uh, Hadassah, you name it, there were camps. All over Russia. Why? Everybody wanted to have a shtickle of Russia. It's going to open. It's a new market. So you have to get your own Jews. You know the joke? You know the joke? You know the joke? You can hear the joke whether you want to or not. Yeah. There was a shliach to Crimea. His name was Lipschitz. And his wife is named Lipschitz also. So he was always traveling to do uh, fundraising for the Moises. And she was running the base Chabad. The conservative Judaism came to Crimea and they met with the community. And so we have to open a conservative uh, congregation. He says, why? We already have. He says, nah, they're no good. What's wrong with Chabad? He says, oh, they don't allow lady rabbis. They say, I don't understand. We have a lady rabbi already. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you could have laughed harder on that joke. What can I tell you? <laughs> you can best Allah. But okay. So the, everybody wants a piece of Russia. Everybody sends people from all over the world, from Europe, from America, from Israel. <coughs> Tuesday, when they wake up near the coup d'etat, what do they do? They call up Russia and say, get out of the country. Get out! Get on the first plane, bus, train, wagon, get out! What about the kids? The parents will come pick them up. And they abandoned the kids and left the country. Except for one stupid, crazy group of Michiganers <laughs> called Chabad. They made a phone call. They called New York and said, what do we do? You have to see the Rebbe's answer. It's incredible. I, I, I never say it correctly because 
The way it's written is better than the way I remember it. The Rebbe said they should stay in Russia and they should finish their holy work, which is including the camps, until the end. Kapashut. Anybody know Hebrew? Kapashut. It's self-evident. That's a Kapashut means. It's self-evident. We were expecting World War III to start. I remember hearing that mine before Thursday. In other words, we heard this answer while the world was still shaking. So the Lubavitchers didn't leave. And then Thursday was over. You understand? Now, girls, why am I telling you all these stories? And you've heard all these stories to me before. I'm sorry I'm boring you with repetition. Because we were drunk with Nissan. We were shikir with Nissan. Shikir with Nissan. We were so saturated with miracles. It's impossible for me to describe to you the extent to which there was no question in any chassid's mind that the Rebbe is going to have a before Shlema. He's going to be Melech HaMashiach and taking us out of golf. Finished. You know, the Rebbe was in the hospital the last couple of months. The Rebbe had a stroke in Chazayin under twice. Do you know that? In 1992, the Rebbe had a stroke. In 1994, it was not an Ibayar, it was a regular year. The Rebbe had a second stroke. Chazayin, also Chazayin under. And he was in the hospital from then till Gimel Thomas. So the Barcha moved into Manhattan. And don't ask, Manhattan was never invaded by a worse group of locusts. <laughs> <laughs> Every shul of Manhattan curses the Chabad since then. Um, they moved into all the shuls. They said, that's that place to sleep and eat, don't ask. They lived in seven, in Manhattan for three months, four months, from Chavzai, no, until Gimel Thomas. Chav Chesivin, five days before, a goy, a reporter, stops a bachir in the lobby of Beis Yisrael, the Beth Israel Hospital. And I says, you still believe he's the Messiah? He says, yeah. Yeah. You mean to tell me he's getting out of that bed and he's leading the Jewish people out of exile? He says, yeah. And the Bukhar says to the reporter, you want to bet? I'll bet you a thousand dollars. The reporter was afraid to make the bet. <laughs> <laughs> the reporter was afraid to make the Think about it. That's how cracked. Let me look. The Ganze Welt. You imagine, uh, he wasn't Jewish, I don't think. He was for sure not from. It's in the easiest thousand dollars. He was afraid to make the bet. Maybe that, that these Michiganers, <laughs> they, they believe it so much, it's got to be true. huh? This is what we were feeling. This is what we were feeling, you know, the, the whole time. Like I told you before, when the Rebbe came back, to, the, when the Rebbe was brought back from the oil, we were dancing. Because the Rebbe said to dance, Simcha. Here they're screaming and crying and here they're dancing and they're screaming at each other for what everyone's doing the wrong thing. This is, this is the mood. This is the Mamda Matzah. This is the background. If you want to understand how we were feeling, there was such a certainty. There was such a certainty. As he knows that Melech HaMashiach is coming. There was no question in our mind. Now, it's 30 years. It's 30 years later. Three, zero years later. And the Mishigai, we still believe. You know, we still believe. Can I tell you something cute? It's not cute, it's actually very serious. <laughs> did you know? Did you know? You didn't know. Well, you, maybe you didn't know, but you don't even know what I'm going to tell you, right? Did you know that the state of New York and the government was afraid that when Gimbal Thomas happens, there's going to be Rachman al-Islam like happened in Jonestown? If you don't know what Jonestown did, ask the girl next to you because I'm not going to say it. They were afraid that Lubavitch, we were cuckoo, cuckoo out of our mind. They had people on the roofs to watch that nobody should do anything stupid. They expected Lubavitch to melt down. Why? That's what happens in cults, you know, you have a belief, and the belief doesn't work out, so it's over. Weeks before Gimel Thomas, weeks, months, they were preparing what's going to be. The chassidim are going to go nuts, we're going to have to protect them from themselves. I, I got to tell you, I was a mashpi in yeshiva. In the years 1994, 95, 96, the government gave so much money for free therapy to Crown Heights or Lomach Any boy with a problem, the government gave a safe girl to Crown Heights, just to Crown Heights. Why? Were they afraid? Chas Vashob, Mishra Goyim, go out of their boxes. And I didn't know about it until many years later. They were pushed afraid that we're going to go cuckoo, nuts. It didn't happen. <laughs> but I remember the free therapy. A couple of years after that, I went over to this therapist guy. He said, you don't have more bracham for sentences, but they can't do it anymore. They might not, there's no government. What's the difference? He says, don't you understand the government? This was all, it was a Gimel Thomas grant. Because they figured, <laughs> we're all Michigan. 
<laughs> and we love to stay. We should stay alive. They paid a lot of money. All the therapists made a killing. The government had gets out. Favos, because the Chabad gets are nuts. It didn't happen. I, 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 when the first time I heard it, I pushed it, I laughed. I laughed. But how good for cash? We were cook. We were I mean, to say we were nuts is an understatement. You see, here's the word, kinder. Here's the word. If a person, I, I'm sorry for saying this because this is it's such a stupid comparison. When a person belongs to a cult, he's a fatalist, right? He believes that this has to happen. If this doesn't happen, the world is ended and finished. We believe Mashiach. Period. But we're not fatalists. In other words, we're, our religion, our connection to Hashem is not fear. It's not superstition. It's true. It's emes. Mashiach is emes. Mashiach was emes in Tavshin and Aleph. Mashiach was emes in Tavshin and Beis. Mashiach was emes in Tavshin and Gimel. Mashiach was emes in Tavshin and Dalad. Mashiach was emes in Tavshin and Hey. And Mashiach was emes in Tavshin and Beis. Yeah, it's not the way we envisaged it. It's not to our plan. But a goy doesn't understand real amuna. When a goy sees people believe the way we believed, they can't help but assume that if the plan is not going to work out, the universe is going to have to end. And that's why they were worried about what's going to happen to us. It didn't. It push. It, I, I'm telling you, when 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 I heard, I pushed it, laughed, mamish, and they gave a lot of money to this. And a lot of it's and say after you make good. Everyone made a couple of dollars from the whole situation. They worried. What are the Mishagayim going to do? Farvas, because I believe in the moon is Mashiach's real, and I believe Mashiach is real means you know what? Let me put it to you differently. Not our belief in Mashiach is real. Mashiach is real. That's what we believe. And because Mashiach is real, and that's what we believe. That doesn't that doesn't age. It gets hard. It gets upsetting. It doesn't die, it doesn't, get, it doesn't age, it doesn't fail, because it's an emes hizach. And the emes of Mashiach is in our hearts, the emes of Mashiach is in our minds, the emes of Mashiach is in our neshama. And then, it was so, you could touch it, you could touch Mashiach, you could touch Mashiach. The, to be sure, right? What's the whole Vata Tetzave about? Kasas Lamoir. Why Kasas Lamoir? The Mashiach is near. The Rebbe wants that we should have a Cheshik and a Ratz of Mashiach to such an extent that without the coming of Mashiach, and I think a lot of us can maybe want Mashiach a little more, just a little drop more. We're doing okay, but Nachabisale. We want Mashiach now. But our belief in Mashiach is not a superstition. Our belief in Mashiach is not a fear. Our belief in Mashiach is not fatalistic. Our belief in Mashiach is a belief in something which is already actual. This is what we experienced. And this is how we felt leading up to Chazai and other and how we reacted to Chazai and other. Would you say that the Babi Chachsidim were normal? Are, are, we're still not normal. I mean, the day the Babi Chachsidim become normal to the in the whole world. Not just on us. But then, the Koch HaMashiach. So I want to finish my speech with this thought. Whenever these days come, whether it's Gimel Tamas, or Chav Zayin, or Chav Ches Nisan, you talk about Mashiach. You talk about Mashiach, because the Rebbe talks about Mashiach. The Rebbe says that the coming of Mashiach depends on us being Teveya, the coming of Mashiach depends on us not for one second stopping to say we want Mashiach now, but and meaning it. And then some are supposed to do that, but Simcha also a Okay, so this is a Fabrengin, and a little bit of a history lesson, and I'm trying to help you appreciate, maybe I didn't do it well, but I tried, to give you a sense of how real Mashiach was then. And to point out, or to inspire, or to mention that it shouldn't be different. The imminence of Mashiach, the urgency, the belief that Mashiach is coming, he melech Mashiach ba is true today and it has to be in our heart with an incredible cheshek with an unbelievable desire an unbelievable want Un it should be, we should want Mashiach and as you all know I'm sure there's only one way to want Mashiach what's that? 
to learn about Mashiach. So if you don't know what Mashiach, you don't know what Mashiach is. You don't know what you want. If you don't know what you want, you can't want it. It's not so complicated to learn about Mashiach. To know what Mashiach is and to desire Mashiach. And so the Eibush Talmud held from our Mashiach is all coming. The pay of my mission. We should see the Rebbe. We should take us out of Golos. But see, we have to And what can I say? Uh, all the brachas, nochamol and nochamol. And uh, thank you for coming, right? And thank you for making it. And thank you for bringing me. Okay, chazak ve'amatz. Cheskivi imti. Zag gezunt stark. We want Mashiach now.